Aung San Suu Kyi is uh, the daughter of the Burmese independence leader Aung San, who was assassinated in 1947 and she became leader of Burma's pro-democracy movement when after she lived abroad for many years she returned home in 1988 initially to look after her mother but she never again left the country until more recently because she feared the military rulers would not allow her to return so of course that made it unable for her to receive her peace prize in person or to actually be with her husband her British husband Michael Arras when he died in 1999 so today not just a big moment for the Nobel Committee but also for the people of Burma and Aung San Suu Kyi herself uh, to appear here and receive her prize formally in person and also to give that speech and it'll be interesting to see what words she has chosen to give in her speech. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, now I have the pleasure to invite the Nobel Peace Prize Laureate of 1991 to come forward to give us her lecture. We do not have a gold medal because it was received by your son Alexander in 1991, but I'm sure that your words to us today will be written in gold. Please. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished members of the Nobel Committee, dear friends, long years ago, sometimes it seems many lives ago, I was at Oxford listening to the radio program Desert Island Disc with my young son Alexander. It was a well-known program, for all I know it still continues on which famous people from all walks of life were invited to talk about the eight discs, the one book beside the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare, and the one luxury item they would wish to have with them were they to be marooned on a desert island. At the end of the program, which we had both enjoyed, Alexander asked me if I thought I might ever be invited to speak on desert island discs. Why not? I responded lightly. Since he knew that in general only celebrities took part in the program, he proceeded to ask me with genuine interest why I thought I might be invited. I considered this for a moment and then answered, perhaps because I'd have won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And we both laughed. The prospect seemed pleasant, but hardly probable. 
I cannot now remember why I gave that answer, perhaps because I had recently read a book by a Nobel laureate, or perhaps because the De desert island celebrity of that day had been a famous writer. In 1989, when my late husband, Michael Ayres, came to see me during my first term of house arrest, he told me that a friend, John Finnis, had nominated me for the Nobel Peace Prize. This time, I also laughed. For an instant, Michael looked amazed. Then he realized why I was amused. The Nobel Peace Prize, a pleasant prospect, but quite improbable. So, how did I feel when I was actually awarded the Nobel Prize for peace? The question has been put to me many times, and this is surely the most appropriate occasion on which to examine what the Nobel Prize means to me and what peace means to me. As I have said repeatedly in, so ma in many an interview, I heard the news that I had been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize on the radio one evening. It did not altogether come as a surprise because I had been mentioned as one of the front runners for the prize in a number of broadcasts during the previous week. While drafting this lecture, I've tried very hard to remember what my immediate reaction to the announcement of the award had been. I think I can no longer be sure. I think it was something like, oh, so this does, they've decided to give it to me. It did not seem quite real, because in a sense, I did not feel myself to be quite real at that time. Often, during my days of house arrest, it felt as though I were no longer a part of the real world. There was a house, which was my world. There was the world of others, who also were not free, but who were together in prison as a community. And there was the world of the free. Each one was a different planet pursuing its own separate course in an indifferent universe. What the Nobel Peace Prize did was to draw me once again into the world of other human beings outside the isolated area in which I lived to restore a sense of reality to me. This did not happen instantly, of course, but as the days and months went by and news of reactions to the award came over the airwaves, I began to understand the significance of the Nobel Prize. It had made me real once again. It had drawn me back into the wider human community. And what is more important, the Nobel Prize had drawn the attention of the world to the struggle for democracy and human rights in Burma. We were not going to be forgotten. To be forgotten. The French say that the part to part is to die a little. To be forgotten, too, is to die a little. It is to lose some of the links that anchor us to the rest of humanity. When I met Burmese migrant workers and refugees, during my recent visit to Thailand, many cried out, don't forget us. They meant, don't forget our plight. Don't forget to do what you can to help us. Don't forget, we also belong to your world. When the Nobel Committee awarded the Peace Prize to me, they were recognizing that the oppressed and the isolated in Burma were also part of the world. They were recognizing the oneness of humanity. So for me, receiving the Nobel Peace Prize means, personally, extending my concern for democracy and human rights beyond national borders. The Nobel Peace Prize opened up a door in my heart. The Burmese concept of peace can be explained as the happiness arising from the cessation of factors that militate against harmo the harmonious and the wholesome. The word nyenjang translates literally as the beneficial coolness, 
that comes when a fire is extinguished. Fires of suffering and strife are raging around the world. In my own country, hostilities have not yet ceased in the far north. north. To the west, communal violence resulting in arson and murder were taking place just several days before I started out on the journey that has brought me here today. News of atrocities in other reaches of the earth abound. Reports of hunger, disease, displacement, joblessness, poverty, injustice, discrimination, prejudice, bigotry. These are our daily fare. Everywhere, there are negative forces eating away at the foundations of peace. Everywhere can be found thoughtless dissipation of material and human resources that are necessary for the conservation of harmony and happiness in our world. The First World War represented a terrifying waste of youth and potential, a cruel squandering of the positive forces of our planet. The poetry of that era has a special significance for me because I first read it at a time when I was the same age as many of those young men who had to face the prospect of withering before they had barely blossomed. A young American fighting with the French Foreign Legion wrote before he was killed in action in 1916 that he would meet his death at some disputed barricade on some scarred slope of battered hill or at midnight in some flaming town. Youth and love and life perishing forever in senseless attempts to capture nameless, unremembered places. And for what? Nearly a century on, we have yet to find a satisfactory answer. Are we not still guilty, if to a less violent degree, of recklessness, of improvidence, with regard to our future and our humanity? War is not the only arena where peace is done to death. Wherever suffering is ignored, there will be the seeds of conflict, for suffering degrades and embitters and enrages. A positive aspect of living in isolation was that I had ample time in which to ruminate over the meanings of words as a small child. Almost on an, a daily basis, I heard elderly and sometimes not so elderly people around me murmuring, Doka, doka, when they suffered from aches and pains or when they met with some small annoying mishaps. However, it is only during my years of house arrest that I got around to investigating the nature of the six great dukkha. These are to be conceived, to age, to sicken, to die, to be parted from those one loves, to be forced to live in propinquity with those one does not love. I examined each of the great sufferings, not in a religious context, but in the context of our ordinary, everyday lives. If suffering were an unavoidable part of our existence, we should try to alleviate it as far as possible in practical, earthly ways. I mulled over the effectiveness of antenatal and postnatal programs and mother and child care, of adequate facilities for the aging population, of comprehensive health services, of compassionate nursing and hospices. I was particularly intrigued by the last two kinds of suffering, to be parted from those one loves and to be forced to live, live in propinquity with those one does not love. What experience might our Lord Buddha have undertaken, undergone in his own life that he had included those two states among the great sufferings? I thought of prisoners of conscience and refugees, of migrant workers and victims of human trafficking, of that great mass of the uprooted of the earth 
who have been torn away from their homes.